Hey everyone, welcome back uh, and welcome to a very, very special CoPlay Extra live show with me, Abhi and Ian. Uh, and we're joined today by a very, very special guest. Um, this man has directed nine incredible films, including one very special documentary, which we will dig into very soon. He has made music videos for Take That, Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, and of course, he has directed 13 CoPlay music videos, including the latest music video for Beautiful. And his Coldplay music videos alone have gained an eye-watering 4 billion views on YouTube and that number is growing every single day. Without much further ado, please welcome the one, the only, Matt Whitecross. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? How is life? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for a lovely introduction. Yeah, and no, I'm, I'm really good, thanks. Um, it's funny that I've been kind of jumping between different projects and normally you work on something so like the way that i do things is like you'll be working a documentary and then maybe it doesn't come out for two years and it's been so lovely with this video we we made it we only went and shot it like three or four weeks ago and then and, and it's it's out there and even that i mean we kind of finished it about a week after we shot it anyway so it's lovely to to start getting the reaction and seeing how people clocked it straight away that's that's absolutely wonderful let's get right into it you know first of all congratulations on the new uh, music video for beautiful, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, Ian and I are big fans. A lot of people really, really love it. Um, so thank you so much for it. That's all, firstly, thank you. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, thank you so much. No, it's it's um it's lovely to. I mean, we were just talking about this before we went live, which is that when I was starting out and when I was growing up, there was no kind of communication. You had no way of telling. You know, you couldn't connect with uh, fans. Couldn't connect with bands or with people that you admired, and vice versa. And I do love that now when things come out, for better or for worse, you definitely get a reaction. So, you know, Coldplay, when, whenever we put something out, generally when I'm looking at everything, it's like the, the love that's coming back for the band is, is nuts. It was hilarious. When this one came out, I was like, it was just like, love, 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 love. I was like, oh, okay, I haven't seen it come out like that before. And then and there's always one person who comes like, that's awful. The only comment is awful. That's the only one you remember. But it's, no, it's been, it's been good. And I, and I just thought that, um, Funny, I'd been away from the band for a while. Like I'd seen them socially a couple of times, but I hadn't, you know, we hadn't been hanging out. And um, and when Chris rang kind of out of the blue, just saying, you know, do you fancy doing something together again? We were in the middle of doing this documentary, so I didn't think it would work. And we just managed to kind of sneak in under the radar, just, just do a quick shoot. So yeah, it was it was it was perfect actually. I, I it could have even the night before we started shooting, I thought this has potential to be a complete disaster, and I'm going to let everyone down as usual. But then it kind of it worked out. No, I, it certainly did. And so you said that it was a pretty quick turnaround. Um, so when did you exactly find out uh, that you were going to be a director for Beautiful? Did they give you enough time for this one? Because they don't really give you enough time for some of these videos. <laughs> it was it was very last minute. But to be honest, I was busy working on this other film. So I, it was, I, you know, I realistically, if I'd been sensible about it, I shouldn't have done it. I kind of I felt like, so, but I, I, you never want to say no, because the, the ideas, Chris always comes up with such great ideas and just the idea of carrying on that relationship. You know, I've always, I, I'd be there at the drop of a hat anyway, but then we were at kind of crunch point on this other film. And I felt like, like if I'm disappearing, one thing is if I'm disappearing for a day, fine. But if I'm disappearing for a week or two, it's like, it's impossible. I'm supposed to be finishing this other thing. Um, these things tend to spiral. And so you kind of just go softly, softly. So we, you know, Chris came in initially. I think he texted me and said, can you come to Guadalajara tomorrow? Because I want to shoot something. I don't really know what it is, but it's involves, it involves Angel Moon, it involves this puppet that we're working with. And I hadn't even seen the live gig at that point. So I just, I was like, okay, fine. They sent me a couple of pictures. And Sam Seeger, who works with the band, who's part of the team now, um, he sent me over a picture of Angel Moon. So I was like, right, okay, I have zero idea of what this is. And the only, there's all these cryptic texts from Chris just saying, yeah, yeah, you just need to get on a plane, come to Mexico tomorrow and film me and this puppet. And then so the next thing was like, no, 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 actually, hold off. We're going to do it in the States. We need a bit, bit of time. So <laughs> that was pretty much all the information I had. And then a couple of weeks later, I think he just, he rang and said, like, oh, we, I've had this idea. I've been talking to Dakota. We thought that it'd be great to do something with um, this, these guys, basically this, he, they've shot, we shot a lot of the documentary in the Henson studio. So where they often record is, um, they've got one place in Malibu that they often record in, which is closer to Chris. And then they've got another place in LA and it's in the Henson studio. And when you go in there, it used to be the Charlie Chaplin studio. And it's got Kermit on the top as you, on the archway as you walk in. 
it's amazing. Like it's got all this history already. And, and everyone, you know, when we, we've been doing this Bond documentary recently, and when I was talking to Paul Epworth, the guy who wrote, co-wrote with Adele, the Skyfall song, he was like, yeah, that's where I, I wrote that song. I started writing that song and I was haunted by the ghost of Karen Carpenter because that's where she used to record. So it's got a lot of history, that place. Mm -hmm. So Chris had been recording there with the band for years. And I think someone, I can't quite remember exactly what he said, but I, I might be getting this wrong. But I think he said, look, obviously it's where they used to do the Muppet show, which is what I grew up with. Like the first record my parents ever bought me when I was like six years old was the Muppet show, the, the soundtrack album. And so I, so that's where they used to film it. And that was like a very big deal, obviously for me growing up many, many, many years ago. And, uh, and he's, someone was talking to Chris and they said, look, you know, we've got like a kind of a room or a storage place where we keep all the Muppets that didn't make it. And he was like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, all the reject Muppets that we didn't really use and never really found a place. And he was like, oh my God, so there's, there, we've got to do something with this. All the rejects, all the weirdos who never really found their place in the sun. So he was like, there's definitely a music video on that. And then I think him and Dakota had a bit of a brainstorm and then he came to me and just said that we had this idea for some kind of, it could be like a kind of metaphor for a lot of the bad shit that's going on at the moment in, in the world. And also, Kind of, could kind of in a way be like the story of Coldplay of these four guys who get together and form a band. They feel like they're misfits, but then they find each other and then they take over the world. So that was that was the genesis of it. So as with a lot of cases, a lot, a lot of times we've made films in the past, videos in the past, often the germ of the idea comes from Chris and then he lets you run with it and then you throw out stuff and then he's very, he's very, very decisive about, okay, I love that. That's This is the best idea you've ever had. This is terrible. This is appalling take that bit out and so you just throw ideas back and forth you know so i just wrote a kind of story based on that and now if i'm remembering yeah he said i think it should start with a job interview with so the manager is and i because i've set up this little scenario but i assumed it was all just to the music and i'm gonna get uh, i'm gonna get like one of my friends maybe robert downey jr to come in and play the bank manager he's gonna do it and we're gonna have a talking scene and then we so we talked about doing that for a while and then I don't know, it just it didn't work out for whatever reason. And so the next thing was like, okay, no, no, we're just gonna do the whole thing with puppets. We're gonna concentrate on the puppets. And uh and yeah, and that and that was it. But that was that whole process from start to finish probably took about five days. Oh wow, that's incredible. That's absolutely amazing. Um I have to say before we continue with our questions, you're getting a lot of love from the chat here. A lot of people are really, really <laughs> Fascinated and also really just happy to see you. Um, more than oh, else. lovely to see you all too. I can't see anyone. I'm just on Zoom, but I'm <laughs> I'm seeing you in my head. Trust me. There's 110 <laughs> people watching, so yeah. you know well, it's all. Thank good. you for joining in, everyone. Yeah, uh, Matt, thanks for giving us part of your Wednesday evening. Honestly, it means a lot. Uh, me and Abby are big fans of the puppets, Team Puppet. Um, there's five main characters: Angel Moon, Donk, the Wizard, Sparkman. And Bruce, the boss, I guess that's obvious where that came from. Um, Donk is my personal favorite, if I'm being honest. He's brilliant. I loved him on the Jimmy Kimmel show as well. Um, how fun was it to develop these characters and how much of that was, um, yeah, you or Chris or how, 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 did, how did the character development start? Well, the, so the initial bit was, uh, let's have a think about this. So basically, yeah, so Chris kind of said, look, um, so we had a chat with the Jim Henson company and those guys got on. We did one of those calls where there's like 20 people on the Zoom. And we kind of said that this is vaguely the idea. We don't quite know how we're going to do it. We'd be like, we have to take advice from you guys. We know it's probably more complicated than we're thinking. Because actually these guys, these guys are geniuses. They've done everything. They're, they're really amazing. But they need, they need what they need. So basically each puppet ideally would have at least two people manipulating the puppet. And then you need, they need a monitor. And then they also need what they call a wrangler, someone to monitor them. Cause you know, like a kind of third person thing that so they, they're so in it that they need someone else to kind of help direct them and then help the director. So we, they were like, look, some of the things you're suggesting are great. Some of these are harder. Let's just talk it through. And um, so then they sent over this list of like a hundred different puppets of things that they've had in the past, things they've used to haven't used. And then I went through and I was like, okay, well, if we're going to make, if we're going to have four people in the band, then it should be these ones. If it's maybe we're going to have more, then we could have backing singers, then maybe we could have someone else. And then Chris initially was like, I think it should be enormous. Like we need to have all these different people. We're going to have 10 people in the band. We're going to have, you know, like he got very excited about it. We're going to have the security guards and uh, we're going to have, we need to have a manager. And the one thing I felt was like, look, even first of all, it starts spiraling out because 
I think in his head, maybe it was going to look like the end of the Muppet movie, which is like 700 mm -hmm. Muppets. And they immediately came back and were like, okay, that obviously anything is possible, but you know, you wanted to do it for this budget and it's going to be, this is going to end up costing more than Star Wars. So, um, <laughs> so we kind of scaled it down a little bit. And then I just felt like time wise, even if you had an infinite budget, you don't have time in the, you know, to try and squeeze all those different stories into, you know, three and a half minutes or whatever it is. So I was like, I, I think we should just concentrate on four plus a manager. And then I picked four and then, you know, we kind of swapped around a couple of things and, but it was pretty much the first four I picked, I think. And then Chris was like, oh, great. Like, okay. I came up with the names like straight away. And then he was very, he was like, oh, and this is, this is, it has to be Bruce Kakemix, but you know, everyone calls him Kate Mix. And he had all this backstory to each of them, which is great. And then once the puppeteers come in, these guys are like, you know, they're, they're, they're geniuses and they have um, a kind of stand up, like a live, you know how they do those kind of, uh, over here in the UK, we had something called Whose Lines It Anyway, when they do the kind of stand up improv, yeah. but with, with, but they do it with puppets, right? And I think it's something they do quite regularly. So you can fire stuff at them and they'll just, they'll run with it. And, and you're, it's just like being a kid in a candy store because it's like, it's almost been my dream to go and you could actually, it's like stepping onto the, the set of the Muppets. And you go, well, we're going to put the camera here and can we do this and this? And then they, they come up with an, an idea that's better. And they're like, yeah, well, if you're, if you're doing this, then I can do this and I can move it. Like the blocking, I mean, this, they're just so smart. So yeah, that, that part of it was, was just pure joy. So in the end, like all these things, it's kind of Chris's idea or Chris and Dakota's idea, which then becomes, has some of my stuff thrown into it, which then Phil contributes to, which then, you know, other people yeah. come in and then the puppeteers bring their thing to. And then, you know, all along the way, so then everyone from the first AD to our DOP, uh, Byron, everyone has has a say. So by the by the end of it, it's not really one person's thing anymore, which is what I love about filmmaking in general. It's like, yeah, you could probably cherry pick a few things and say this someone had this thought, this one, but by the end, it's really made by everyone. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. I you know I saw in the chat uh, someone uh, kind of daring you to say Bruce Kakemik's last name properly, so you did that correctly. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I love about it. So Chris, as soon as we I saw that puppet and I was like, I think he should probably be the manager because he seems like a very unmanagery manager in the same way that I think Phil probably by his own admission is a very unmanagery manager. He wasn't, he's not the manager anymore, but he was originally. And, uh, and Chris was like, yeah, okay, great. And then he sent me, I think he was texting me saying, this is his name, but you can't pronounce it like that. Otherwise he gets very upset. I'm like, okay, that's great. Even if it also never the, ends up in the video, it's, it's cool. Also the reference to Bruce being the boss is just amazing as well, I think. You know. <laughs> that's very nice. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, the storyline for for the music video kind of mirrors the story of the band to an extent. You talked about this as well. And, you know, it's kind of that storyline has been a winning formula uh, for a lot of successful Coldplay videos in the past, uh, you know, with Paradise, Sky Full of Stars, etc. The work that you've done and like on other videos as well with Fix You, Champion of the World from other directors. So is it like intentional and a conscious decision to go down that route again with this music video, with that formula? No, I think we just don't have very many good ideas. <laughs> just, <laughs> so, so someone was pointing out the other idea, the, the other day that they all finish off, nearly all finish off with lots of fireworks. For, and I was like, did they? It was like, oh yeah, we did then Charlie Brown and we we did it in, yeah. we did Sky. Yeah, anyway, so we all, Sky, fireworks or confetti, basically. Yeah, we're, I'm a one trick pony. But I think it was, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think there was something very charming about these four puppets getting together. And I think when, and I think Chris said after we'd kind of been talking about what the idea might be, he was like, well, maybe it should just be a place where they're second class citizens and we can use it without being too on the nose. You know, I think we all know we're living through tough times right now. And I think there's a lot of prejudice and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of bullshit out there. And there's a lot of people in power who are attempting to divide, you know, divide all of us for their own, for, for the sake of their, you know, keeping power and, and uh, you know, all those things. And that's happening in the UK and right now there's a, there's all kinds of nonsense going on politically and the same thing in, in the US and, and all around the world. So I just, it felt like there's a way somehow for me, when you do things slightly metaphorically, you do, it could be through sci-fi or it could be through puppets, it could be whatever. Somehow some, it, it, it lands better, I think, than, than if you were just doing a straight version of what's out there, because then, you know, I think we all know deep, deep down that prejudice is, is crazy, like it's nonsense and it's something that's kind of indoctrinated and pushed into us. But on the other hand, when it's when you're fed that kind of daily thing from the newspapers and TV all the time and from politicians, you're like, well, maybe there's something in it. And actually, if you take it down to this, the level of puppets, 
you're like we're all the same we're all equal there shouldn't be dis- discrimination it's pretty obvious right. i feel like the older i get the simpler i think things are it's like most people i meet are good people and most things that they want in life are decent and actually there is enough to go around it's just but if you talk to people in charge like, no 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 this guy over here wants your job this guy over here doesn't like you, you know it's all it's all that kind of stuff and it's all nonsense but once you get kind of caught up in it, then it, it feels real. So I, yeah, I think I like that side of things. And then, and then we st- I started having fun just putting together kind of humans only graphics and things like that. It was, yeah, it was great. Yeah, I think Chris is on record a few times saying he thinks things are easier to say. It's easy to say things about the real world when you're referring to maybe aliens or fictional characters. Um, so you yeah, know, maybe I think those, so. ref- those references in the video, even though it's like, um, you know, it can be seen as uh, the the video is lighthearted in, in in general tone, but it does have some deep inspiration from, I guess, you could say racial discrimination um, from history or from present day. Sure. Or, you know. So yeah, and you can we, see we, what's we, going on right now. Yeah, for sure, you see what's going on right now, even like in this country with trans rights and gay rights and stuff. It's weird. I think a lot of battles that people thought were won, I think it's, it could uh, be to do with abortion rights in the U- U.S that actually you have to keep on fighting for people's rights all the time. It's not, you can't take anything for granted. So, yeah. And so I think in a, in a, in a, hopefully in a kind of subtle way, we can talk about those things in, in music and in videos. Absolutely. All right. Um, the video is joyful to watch, however, even though it does have those deeper <laughs> messages and it's entertaining enough in its own, but that after party scene at the after show party scene is one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen in a Coldplay music <laughs> video. So, um, oh, whose good. idea was that? How how did that come around? Like all the best ideas, it was Chris's, and he just okay. said. And again, it was weird. I, I think I'd I'd put together like the story and sent it back to him and said, yeah, yeah, great, all perfect, brilliant. You know, I'll see you on set. Uh, but there needs to be an after party, by the way, and it should just be like they're having the best time ever when they are. You know, so that was that was the brief, and it should be kind of neon and a bit dirty. And I mean, the idea <laughs> of putting those guys in the real world and, and just like they're having a really messy party at the end was, was fun. Yeah, but that was, that was Chris. That's which, uh, we, we, we had a question, which, uh, which of the weirdos is the most fun at the after party from your experience uh, hanging out with them? Oh, that's a good, well, you would expect it to be someone like Donk, right? But I think when, when Bruce lets his hair down, it can get pretty messy. <laughs> so I would say probably Bruce a dark horse. I see, yeah. okay. And absolutely no connection to Phil, obviously. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Phil is very well behaved at all times. Perfect. Um, man, thank you so much. One of the final questions we really have for Beautiful and the music video is, you know, a lot of people are wondering, as always, uh, what's next? So how, so, you know, one of the main questions we got from all the fans is like, how uh, will things probably play out with the weirdos? Has Chris dropped there any hints? Uh, do you expect we'll be seeing anything more? Is there anything uh, we can find out about, you know, the weirdos in the future? Yeah, I hope so. I feel like there's more, more we could, uh, they, they've got still got things, more adventures to go on. So uh, yeah, we'll see. I think watch this space. Um, yeah, there's definitely a couple of things cooking. So yeah, hope, hopefully soon. Okay, we'd love to hear it. Awesome. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to, uh, you know, some of the other work that you've done with the band. And there's so much that we can dig into and this can, this discussion can go on for hours. But we want to focus on two particular uh, music videos that have had such a huge effect uh, on the band and just on everyone, really. Uh, and that's, you know, Paradise and um, uh, A Sky Full of Stars. And you're well known for directing a lot of f- f- famous music videos, but these two have really like skyrocketed uh, when they kind of came out, you know. Um, and, and these videos, they must have been absolute chaos behind the scenes because, uh, you know, the amount of time and the turnaround, et cetera, et cetera. But they've turned out to be some of the most viewed videos of all time. Um, you know, seeing those experiences, uh, obviously we know you guys are great friends, but you know, as you said, when you see Chris's uh, name on your phone and it's ringing, do you get a rush of panic? How do you feel? Uh, because there's so many times it's turned out to be an absolutely insane adventure. Yeah, I, no, I'm always really excited. I mean, it's not always about a video, but it's, but the, in those two cases, I think with Paradise, it was, it was, again, it was nuts because I was working on something else. And the way these things come together, Chris was just like, look, can you get that? I think they'd had some, they'd had actually shot a video and for whatever reason, tonally, it wasn't right for them. And, it, you know, they, I think there was an important that we'd, we'd done every teardrop already on that album. 
Uh, but then for, I think I think I'm getting this right. So then, but I think with Paradise, they'd been working with someone else, and for whatever reason, it's it's sometimes hard with music videos. You got to represent a, a, the song, and I think Chris particularly, you know, he feels very keenly whether it's working or not, and he and he gets very involved. And so I, yeah, I got a call basically saying, look, can you get on a plane tomorrow to come to? I guess it was was it that? Yeah, I think it was literally just, can you get come to South Africa tomorrow morning? And this was like already kind of two in the afternoon and you've got to come up with a new idea and here's the track. And I was like, oh God, so what? So I came up with some ideas. I think they were all quite serious, you know, cause it's got serious stuff going on in it. And it was, I think it was set in a South African township cause I'd spent time there a while back. I remember I'd gone there when I was 18 and I'd spent a lot of time in the townships and I'd done some filming. And so I, so I was like, well, those, they're amazing places. They've got such an amazing vibe to them. And, uh, and I think, you know, like everyone else, I love the film City of God. Anyway, so I sent over a bunch of ideas. I was like, well, we could try this and we could try that. And maybe we follow a little girl. And then immediately came back and said, no, no, just bring an elephant costume and a unicycle <laughs> and we'll work it out. And so then I was like, okay, fine. So what is it? And he was like, well, I, I can, and I, do we need a double? And what are we doing? And then he's like, no, I think you should just be, keep it simple. It's just a, just the story of, of an elephant that needs to get, you know, be reunited with his friends. And so I was like, okay. So then I kind of wrote out a story saying, could it be this? And then didn't hear back. And then the next thing was like, we turned up, literally just drove from the airport to the hotel and Chris ran out. So where's the costume? Stuck it on, it was like perfect. And then we got in a pickup truck and drove off and just shot it for two days. So, and we were make, completely making it up on the spot. And the one thing I remember was that Chris really didn't want to be seen in it. He was like, I'll oh, know I'm in it. And I was like, I, yeah, but I feel like everyone else would just assume you had nothing to do with it. He's like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine. But anyway, at one point I managed to convince him to take his hat off. And even then he was like, no, don't use that bit, don't use that bit. But I put it in and luckily sense prevailed, I think, in the end. Bill was like, I think we have to have it in, otherwise he's gonna assume it's a double. But the um but yeah, with this and Sky Full of Stars, I think it was something similar. I think maybe they'd they'd done another video and again if for whatever reason it, it wasn't right for that song or didn't Chris felt it wasn't right. And so it was all last minute and I got I was shooting a commercial in Italy and I came back and I was supposed to be going back to Italy uh, to Lake Cromwell the next the come the next day to try and uh, like finish it off. I think we'd done the wrecking, we're going back. And he was like, right, can you get on a plane today and come to Tokyo? Because we, we need to shoot something. And I was like, I can't, I can't come to, today. And he was like, all right, well, then come to Australia tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I got on a flight to Australia. And it was my, I'd, we just had our daughters. It was my first Father's Day. And I'd never been to Australia before. And I got on the plane. And when I got off the plane, it wasn't Father's Day anymore. So I spent my first Father's Day on, on the plane. I got off and we met and, and on just as I was getting on the plane that, you know, we didn't even have a camera person or anything like that. And, uh, and they sent over these, like they normally send over CVs. If you, if you can't work with your normal team, they're just like, well, look, here's a bunch of local people. And they went through and I was like, oh yeah, they're all great. They're, yeah, any of these people would be amazing. Hang on, Andrew. And then they said, look, Andrew Lesney, why do I know that name? And it's like, isn't that the guy who just shot Lord of the Rings? It's like, yeah, yeah. But he's really excited. He wants to do it. And I was like, well, yeah, let's get him. It was amazing. And he, he was so excited about the idea of shooting something on the crappiest camera ever, ever, you know, with no, nothing. It was just him running around. And he was the sweetest, sweetest man. It was one of the loveliest things. And he was like, we, we, we've got to do a film together. And then, he, and very sadly, he died a year later and, and we never got to meet up again. But anyway, it was, it was an amazing experience. So, but it's, to be honest, it's always chaos. I've never not had a chaotic experience in a very good way. You know, we've always turned up without really knowing what we're doing. And because I guess because there's mutual trust and friendship there, then everyone's like, look, we'll figure it out. I love that so much. Absolutely incredible. Both stories. I mean, every story you have is super fascinating because they all seem like such a mad rush. But no, that's <laughs> that's absolutely incredible. It's terrifying look as well. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie. And there was, I think, on Adventure of a Lifetime, we thought we were doing him for the weekend. So that's, I mean, even now it's given me palpitations. And so we turned, we turned <laughs> up and the only bit of the story that was the same was that they were wearing these, these crazy suits, but we were there with the whole team and we were playing him for the weekend and Chris just walked in and was like, no, no, it's not that song anymore. We've got another song, now. <laughs> which wasn't even finished. It was like just the, just the guitars and the instrumentals there. So yeah, it was, that was nuts. And, we, and I'd written down again, I'd written down some idea, which was kind of we're following Chris through this kind of magical dreamlike Alice in Wonderland worlds. And he'd gone the night before, he was like, nah, I don't think that's right. And it was the wrong track it, anyway. And I was like, well, look, I think we should we just turn up and we'll shoot something. 
even if it's wrong, like we've spent the money, like there's what's the, you know, it's the band's one day off on tour, but like, why don't we just, so we shot it in Kentish town, just near where I live. Um, and we turned up and it was li literally just down to Andy Circus and his team saved the day because they had all these, what they call avatars. So obviously they had all the, pe the people, all the kind of things that they'd used, just very kind of sketchy versions. There was like rock stars, uh, zombie. And they were, they're all kind of quite geeky. There was like a, there was yeah chimpanzee there was godzilla and then they had and one of them was, was these these chimpanzees and so it was like and everyone wanted to be the chimpanzee and so at a certain points like, okay well i guess that's what we're doing so we literally figured out on the spot but it was yeah it was pretty it was pretty scary <laughs> at a certain point when when grown-ups come in and like just whenever someone comes in like phil or like sam who then was working at, from, at parliament it's like so what are you guys doing then you like you just feel like someone's literally about to tap you on the shoulder and go get out of here you don't know what you're doing but it, but it was yeah it was it was fun with hindsight it was fun <laughs> love that you got to work with some amazing people there and you know the videos have all turned out great i think there's nearly four billion views for matt wycross coldplay videos on youtube alone. right so you know wow well the, well, the interesting thing with that is it's funny because i was talking to my father-in-law and he was like wow you know this is amazing that all these and i was like yeah but it, that's it's got nothing to do with me it's, it's to do with coldplay and i think when paradise <laughs> When we had the uh, when we did the video, we, because of that thing that they'd been about to release another video, and then the timing was late, so they just had to put out a card which was literally just said Paradise Coldplay, and yeah. that got like fifty billion views. <laughs> so <laughs> get, getting like a hundred, you know, hundred million views afterwards is like okay, fine. I don't think it's got anything to do with the video, but it's very nice. Um, probably hard, but we had a lot of people asking you asking this on the hashtag. Um, What's your favorite music video, Coldplay music video from your collection? Um, of, if, of ours? You can't answer that, we've got a good counter question. <laughs> counter question. I, do, I gotta say, I, yeah, they've all, they've all been amazing. They've all been amazing. I, I've got, I, yeah, there's not, I couldn't really pull one out. I mean, I think they, those, Chris was talking about this one. I think his three favorites that we've done together, he was saying this is the third part of a trilogy. And then he got worried because right. he said, oh, but aren't, isn't the third part of a trilogy always shit? He was like, please don't make this shit. <laughs> but and then, then I was like, no, no, it's fine. And then we started pulling out. We were, no, no, there are some good ones. Well, I can't even remember what they were now. But yeah, generally the third part of any trilogy is rubbish. But he was, he, yeah, he said Paradise, Adventure of a Lifetime, and then this were all the kind of stories of bands and how bands formed and got together. And I and yeah, I suppose so. Maybe as a collection, those three. But then again, I mean, like the the worst experience I think any of us have ever had on a film set was. Christmas, we did a video for Christmas Lights for, this, uh, for a song, Christmas yeah. song. And um, and it was the first one I'd done with them where it was kind of pretty big budget. And again, we, it had escalated from Chris saying, look, I think you should just film me walking down the street singing the song in the snow. It's like, okay, great, I'll shoot it on, on my camera. To then having, you know, 50 people stood around while the piano breaks and it's snowing and the poor, okay. the guys were freezing. And we had... It was supposed to be all one one shot and the camera just couldn't it was almost impossible and things kept on breaking and then it turned i think it turned out great it was one of my favorites so i you know so off, sometimes the worst shoots end up with the best results i think and that's do you have a favorite video that wasn't directed by you a favorite coldplay music video that wasn't directed by you oh god that there's so the many good questions. ones yeah there's so many good ones i mean if you yeah, I, I I love. I mean, I'm always I always love seeing what they get up to when I'm not around. I I was, I loved the Strawberry Swing one off the top of my head. Uh, the Shinola one is amazing. There's so many. I mean, all the recent ones they've been doing with Dave Myers are great. Uh, yeah, I I always as a kind of, I'm a a fan since the beginning, since before the beginning. So I love seeing what they get up to. No, nice. that's good, 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 good shout out there with the uh, Strawberry Swing. That'll make a lot of fans happy. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. It's a great video. I haven't seen it. It makes me want to watch it again. Yeah, uh, probably that's exactly what I'm going to do after we're done here. So thank yeah. you. For, I mean, Those guys, you know, incredible. That's what the best part is. You know, when we get back to these videos um, after after some time, um, we kind of remiss about, oh, that's the song launch then. This is the music video, the concept. Um, and obviously, Matt, because you've done so much for uh Go play as a band, obviously the fans as well. People really love everything that you do, but I would, I think I can speak for the whole fandom here when I say that everyone special has a special place in their heart for you because of the Head Full of Dreams documentary, the film that you made, which was absolutely incredible, got an incredible reception. For those who don't know, it premiered in uh, cinemas before streaming on Amazon Prime uh, the next day, and we had at least 300,000 people from around the world, uh, you know, flock to the theaters to watch the film. 
Um, how do you look back on that whole body of work now? Obviously, a huge undertaking. It took so much work, and a personal story for yourself too. So, how do you, you know, how, how are you feeling about it after all this time? I I was just so glad we got to do it because for so many years we were filming and we filmed all the time. You know, we we're filming since before they were a band, and I would every every year or so. You know, obviously we hang out all as, as friends from time to time, and sometimes I come to the gigs, but. Often, if I come to a gig, then they would say, oh, well, you know, bring a camera. And then if they're in the studio, even if it was just to come and hang out, I would like, okay, I'll bring a camera, film something. And sometimes it would be more formal. You know, they'd be like, okay, like when, we would, when they were doing Viva La Vida, I hadn't seen them for a while. And I'd been off trying to break into making films. And they, and they were off becoming huge. And then Phil rang out of the blue and was like, well, you should come down to the studio, but bring some cameras, but let's do it properly. And so we shot on film, which had like three different film cameras running and it was it was amazing seeing what they were like with Brian and all those things were, 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 were great and at the end of it we cut together all this material and I was like I just got really excited because I was, I thought what we shot was amazing and then they were like yeah, yeah just 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 stick it on the shelf it's fine and then the same thing the next year and they said you know so it was never I, I was assumed one day we might get something to do with you know get to do something with it but maybe not for another 50 years and then it was only I think and I'm trying to remember this but I, I think when um so Phil and Chris asked me out to go and, uh, film, uh, go and uh, shoot one of the live gigs on the Headphone of Dreams tour. And I was finishing off the film Supersonic, the, the Oasis one we did. And so, you know, as I was sitting there, while we weren't working, I would go off and start trying to edit and finish off the film in the corner of the dressing room. And they started looking because they're all Oasis fans anyway, and, and they know Nolan and Liam. And so they, they were like, mm, maybe it's time to do our one. And they kind of, we still talked about it a little bit. And then, and then I think I showed Phil said, well, have you got any material from my like early days? Show me, show me like the worst stuff you've got. Tell me, cause Chris is always like, no, I hate seeing myself. I don't want anyone else to, I don't want this, this film to happen. Just show me like the, show me the worst stuff you've got. And so I showed him a couple of clips, one of which we use in the film that the four years that when he somehow yeah. miraculously pre predicts superstardom. And, um, and he was like, oh, thank you for showing that to me because there's, there's no way in a million years. Chris was just like, he'll, he'll want that tape and he'll want to burn it. So thank you because that just shows that we can never make this film. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. And then bizarrely, I think a few weeks later, he rang me and was like, the weirdest thing happened. I was just watching that clip back and Chris saw it and I thought, oh, he's, he's going to, you know, he's going to either hate it or laugh. Or so. And he was like, oh, this is great. We should, we should, maybe we should make this film. So yeah, for a long time, I never thought we were going to make it. And then halfway through the process of actually putting it together, Phil watched a cut and it was very, you know, to be fair, it was very rough. And I think he watched it and was like, this is a car crash. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. just forget it. And so, you know, and then we had like a very honest talk and I was like, look, we're, we're, we're doing it. So let's finish it. You can do whatever you want with it at the end, but let us like finish the process. And, um, and he did. And, and luckily for me, he, you know, at the end of that process, like, okay, no, it's, it's good enough to, to release. But I was, yeah, it was touch and go even during the during making it. So I'm just so relieved we actually got to make it. Uh, we are too. <laughs> We're relieved. Yeah, that, that feel kind yeah of honestly, good. like <laughs> the fan, the fans appreciate the documentary so much. I can speak for myself and say I laughed in the cinemas. I cried. Felt like I watched my whole life as a Coldplay fan flash before me. You know, and there was a it's lot. An to amazing cover journey it. they've been on, right? That's that's the thing. It's yeah. like I think it's funny how there's other you know bands that they love and that. Have they, you know, at the beginning they emulated like Radiohead, for example, who are constantly reinventing themselves. And I think, but I think Coldplay have done exactly the same thing, just in a different way. Yeah. You know, I think every single album, like, and that's why I wanted to start when um, we were in Australia, actually, on that, I think on that other shoot. And, um, and yeah, I think, no, it must have been later, but like on another tour, but anyway, a guy just showed me some clips. And, and it was just, as I started talking to him about it, just said, talking about, the huge chasm between where they'd started and, and where they were now. And that felt like a good place to start. It's like they've, they've evolved so much. It could almost be a different band, but somehow they've got something that's, there is something that unifies them through all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, I have a question uh, about, you mentioned uh, Oasis and Liam and No. Obviously you did Supersonic, which is a fantastic film. Like, honestly, uh, I think a lot of Brits will love that, or Oasis fans in general. Um, did they know you was the Coldplay video guy when they hired you for that? Because there was tensions between Oasis and uh, Coldplay in the mid 2000s. Oh yeah, well, so Noel's, Noel's friends with all the Coldplay guys. I think, yeah. and Liam, they know Liam, so they've, but 
yeah no he would just he would take the piss out of me sometimes because because like, i remember we i tend to one thing because i think i think uh there was some kind of cross wired thing where he was like uh he saw johnny at some at chris's birthday or something and right. and he was like oh i'm making a i'm doing a video with your guy i'm doing a film with your your guy and and, chris, and i think they just shot something with someone completely different i, I can't remember who it was and then they go away. So he was like, you, he was, he was Noel, who loves to wind you up, was taking the piss out of me and saying, you never worked with Coldplay. They haven't heard of you. I was like, no, no, yeah, but I, honestly, yeah, I'm sure. But, and Liam liked, he, I think he has a kind of grudging respect for Coldplay. Like, I think he does yeah. like, uh, probably not all their music, but I think he does like them. And I think he, he was a big fan at the beginning. And the first, I think the first two albums, he was a bit of a groupie and turn, used to turn up at all the gigs and see them backstage. But um, yeah, I think he was... <laughs> I remember him saying that when we were talking about it. I was like, I, I said, it's fine, it's fine not to like them. He was talking about it. He's like, oh, you hang out with those guys, don't you? And I was like, like yeah, they're, they're my friends from many years back. And he was like, all right. And he kind of went, yeah, it's all gone. He went, it's all gone a bit fucking Cirque du Soleil now, isn't it? But I, was like, <laughs> I was like, well, they put on a good show. I'm not sure about Cirque du Soleil, but, but yeah. So I, I think there's a kind of, Noel is great mates with, uh, with Chris. And I think I think there's with Liam. I think he I think he likes them, despite the fact that he probably feels like he shouldn't, because you know they're too nice or something. Rock and roll roots, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think, I think like Liam in, when in he gets ways, to hang out. So I was going to say Liam when he gets to hang out with him, he's a very sweet guy. He's not what uh, certainly what I expected. He's a very he's, right. feels he must have that side to him. He was very gentle and sweet with us. It felt like from the outside, at least, maybe you'd helped to bridge the gap between Liam and Chris. And that's why we got a performance together in Manchester in 2017. Like that would seem inconceivable from the outside, I think, uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, that was amazing. That gig was incredible. I was really, uh, yeah, Yeah. that was a lovely, really lovely moment. Absolutely. Um, Matt, continuing on with the documentary, are you aware of the movement that you've started among Coldplay fans? by using the song The Race, which is an unreleased track from the <laughs> 2010s. The amount of questions Phil and I guess the band in general have got from the fans about The Race is absolutely amazing. I, it's weird, isn't it? It's great. It's a great song, the version that I've heard. I don't know. It's probably... I get sent songs from time to time that they, they just... I, I, I've no idea. In the same way that I think Tim, who's one of Chris's best mates, is a sounding board. I don't know that I know anything about anything, but I remember they sent me People of the Pride five years ago or something and I not to do anything with it just to kind of just send it to me and it was very different and less rocky and it was beautiful and then I was like oh great thinking oh maybe we're doing a video and then I never heard about it again and the same with the race that I got sent it I got sent it and then I heard them mixing it and so I just happened to be in the room while they were mixing it so it was in the background to all their conversations and I because they're talking over it I was like I, my argument was like look it's, if you're not going to use it then and it's not spoiling it too much it's it's going to be hard to take out of that scene anyway for a start but also it's a beautiful tune if you're not going to use it let's have it in the film mm-hmm. and phil i thought they'd just say no but yeah phil was like yeah okay just stick it in i mean you you're only hearing a little bit of it i mean it's, yeah. yeah but it's wonderful I, the frustrating thing for me i mean the wonderful thing to be in the middle of those, those rooms and get to hear them making this great music but you know when you hear something on the radio and and you're like what is that tune that's amazing and then you can just shazam it or ask someone it's like okay and you can listen to it and we have access, we can tap into this amazing reservoir of music now. But if the music's not finished, it's not out there, you can't. So I remember for a long time going, what is that song I've got in my head? I can't work it out. I realized it was the race, but I couldn't, as I couldn't go on, on Spotify and find it. I couldn't go on YouTube. So um, yeah, they have that. And that's kind of going back to when I was a kid where, yeah, you might see something on TV and think it's your best the best film you've ever seen you wouldn't be able to see it for another five six years or the same for a tune you hear it on the radio that's it it's like that was it you know when you're never going to get you know unless you can somehow track it down so i quite like that side of things that i'll hear tracks in embryonic form and then six years later it finally comes out oh. i'm sure it'll come out eventually surely <laughs> when they're 100 years old that's what that's what uh, we've been promised let's see fingers crossed i know it's a big demand um another thing i think what they what they that, you know their sense of what's good what what are great tracks and what aren't and even yeah. in their back catalogue is so different from mine anyway for a long time i had we'd found that footage that miller had shot so it's a miller was someone who traveled with the band for years and was involved in all sorts of things in terms of the sound of the live sounds and also in terms and then he began kind of archiving all the stuff that had ever been shot and then he ended up 
he's a documentarian as well so he he shot a ton of stuff that we used in the film and he shot this one beautiful clip which is chris just sitting down in soundcheck and writing prospects march which is one of my favorite songs mm -hmm. and uh and then so i put it in the film and i was this is great and then i got the only note i got back from phil on the cut was like yeah just take that song out it's terrible i was like what and then like because i had proposed that they could play it on the c stage and we could use it as a way of linking in from the past to the present so he could be composing oh. it and then they play it on the c stage in real life and in, in present day and then that's a way of bringing us back to the present at the end of the film but that was like <laughs> no so luckily we got to keep it oh wow well that's well that's an exclusive we haven't we ha i don't think i've heard that one before ian um no nope. <laughs> well i phil phil really needs to uh, listen to that song again it's a great great song um, i think phil likes it i think chris didn't like it but maybe that's at that time as well <laughs> yeah i think probably, he's yeah. uh he probably ebbs and flows what he what he enjoys from their past mm -hmm. fair enough you know speaking of things that are also in demand uh you know a lot of fans have also been asking us um and this, this, there's a reason behind this, you know, now we know that Coldplay have like a limited amount of albums to go, lots of talks of 2025 being it and no more albums after that. Um, they'll continue touring, they aren't breaking up or anything of that sort, but you know, they're kind of coming to an end of that journey um, as an album making band. Um, are you kind of tempted to dive back in and do a round two, like an updated version of uh, what things have been happening in the Coldplay world? Well, I, I, I love spending time with them. I think, I mean, I'm every time I say I'm not going to do any more music films, then another amazing opportunity comes round. So we've just been doing, I, I had said I wasn't going to, we did a boxing film, boxing TV show. Yeah. And I was like, right, I'm done with music for a few years. And then we got contacted to do this. We're doing one about the music of James Bond at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I was like, mm, I kind of, okay, one more, that's it. And then we've got a couple of other things. I've got a couple of dramas, one of which involves music, but is set in latin america and uh, so again it was just like uh, i could be but that, that's that's uh well it's not fiction but it's, it's a drama rather than documentary but you know you get given these opportunities i mean some have been i get approached almost like on a weekly basis to make films about some of my favorite bands of all time which is quite hard to turn down on the other hand you know i feel like i've, I've kind of done that yeah. you know so i i kind of feel like i want to do other stuff but you know like maybe when we're all 100 years old we'll, we'll do a recap <laughs> maybe my kids could make it fair enough fair enough um you know i think we're almost at the end you have one final question from matt if i'm not wrong yeah i just had one i, I was going to ask you and you touched on it a little bit earlier um have you watched get back by the, the beatles peter jackson oh yeah yeah of course it's yeah, amazing okay. so can you tell phil next time you see him that we'd really love a get back style film for the viva era because that you you just said you got it all on film you know all the chaos that was going on around the band, Chris getting kicked out of the band, Brian Eno up close, Phil coming back in, you know, all that chaos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, There's a lot of stuff he, shot. What? So go. I was gonna, I was gonna say it went on. That album went on to win Grammys for fun, and you know, it kicked off a massive tour, and you know, set them on a new level with sellout shows at Wembley and the Camp Nou and things like that. You know, so a get back Viva style doc. Yeah, uh, it's one of my favorite periods of, of theirs i think the um i remember what we did so they had this thought again this footage is just sitting on a hard drive somewhere where they had this thought of like how can we you know it's annoying if i turn up with a camera and it, obviously like the atmosphere in a room changes as soon as someone's actually pointing especially if it's a good camera and it's big then it starts changing everything and so then so they were like yeah that's i mean it's fine like you know you can do it but also i was busy doing other stuff and so then uh, and and every time i'd be away from the band then they go oh the most amazing thing happened yesterday yeah and this is all pre everyone having great phone great you know, uh videos on their phones so then we set up like a kind of like a system where they, in each room in the in the bakery there were like four cameras running 24 7 always running and so every time kylie or someone like that dropped by to come and do something then that we still have all that footage and the music and the sound was recording all the time. So yeah, that's sitting on a hard drive somewhere. Um, and they were, and then they would move them around. Miller was in charge of all that stuff. So it's probably, you know, I'm in my upstairs office bit now. It's probably sitting on a hard drive in the corner here. <laughs> but it would require someone to go through it all. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, definitely, like for sure. And but also, I think, I think why I'm still amazed that the bands 
allowed us to, to make that film anyway was they don't really like to look back too much. Maybe it'll be different in the future, but I think they 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 like they always think about the next thing rather than the last thing. So I, who knows? But yeah, maybe I think it'll be a few years before they want to go back again. Yeah, it took Get Back a few years to come out. So <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. That's a, that's a, I mean, I was talking. You know, it's a, it's such a great show that, and it was but it was interesting because obviously Peter Jackson's uh, uh, fantastic and he's a, he's a bit of a genius, but then. The original was so Michael Lindsay Hogg, who was yeah. the director on it, was kind of came out of it worse. I, I was so amazed by it because I think it was, mm. yeah, okay, fine. People were, like, were kind of laughing at the idea that he was being, being annoying because he kept him coming in with ideas. That's basically what I do on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm like, the, not, I'm the annoying guy in the corner who comes up and goes, yeah, we could go and shoot this in Jordan. And everyone's like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Or, or whatever the thing might be. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I've got a lot of time for it. I think like the, the achievement of that between those two directors is amazing. That's amazing. Well, I can tell you, um, you know, there are a lot of volunteers here in the chat who would happily sit and go through hours <laughs> and hours and hours of footage. So if you ever need people, to, just let us know. We'll get you a good team of people to look at the footage if you ever want some. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, All right, great. Yeah, we should just release it online and everyone can cut their own version of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so send um, the NDAs. 7,000 yeah. hours. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Matt, from our end, we're we're uh, we're through, but we had uh, we gave some fans the opportunity to like send some questions in, so we just want to go to some of those right at the end and chat if you have any final ones, and we'll kind of wrap it up from there. Um, I'll start off sure. with the first one. Um, it's from uh, Melanie. Um, she's asking, "Have you ever felt like the weirdos? And if so, you know what keeps what keeps you motivated in life? What would you advise to people who might feel discouraged, like they don't fit in?" Uh, such a great question. Um, hi, Melanie. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, and and not even just as a kid, but I think even now it's interesting. Now I have three kids of my own, seeing my life through the prism of, you know, they, they go to school every day and they come back and they might be extremely happy about the way the day went or really disheartened. And it's your sense of self-worth is so often caught up in other people's opinions of you. But half the time, they're, they're not even that caught up. You, you just, it's like your imagined idea of what other people think of you. And I think I don't think that goes away. I think you don't have to scratch the surface very hard of any grown up, even very powerful people that, or very successful, very famous people that I've met, met and actually you realize they're still just like a slightly frightened child underneath that, who's <laughs> just kind of winging it like we all are, you know. And I definitely, I, people talk a lot about the imposter syndrome and I have that, you know, I've been working in film and TV and music and all that stuff for a long time now and I, but I still feel like I don't really know what I'm doing. But maybe then once you start feeling like you really know what you're doing and you're kind of just knocking it out, then maybe that's when it's time to give up because you're just doing it on automatic pilot. I don't know. But yeah, I, I think for sure, I think we all have that. And I and I, that's why I loved Chris's initial idea because I think we're all weirdos really, you know. And, and actually a lot of times when I meet people who seem the most together on the surface and then you spend a little bit of time getting to know them and you realize they're just as insecure as everyone else, they just have a better way of hiding it. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great answer. That's a superb answer. Fantastic. Um, yeah. You know, um, the next question we have is uh, from Motti. Uh, he asks, um, you know, what part of the filming process you like the most and which ones do you like the least? Uh, Pre-production, production, post-production? Post uh, well, that's another great question. I, it depends it's changed because my background, so I started out knowing that I wanted to be a director, thinking it was impossible. Didn't know anyone who worked in film. My parents didn't do that. We didn't know anyone. So it was like, and there's, I think even more then than now, there's a, such a huge gap, such a gulf between, you know, the people watching films or making music and then, you know, wanting to make music and then the actual people who do it because there was no, there was no social media back then. And so I never really thought I'd get a chance to do it. When I first started to do things on my own, I would just grab, you know, my dad had bought a Hi8 camera for the family. So we had that, we didn't have any way of editing. So I had to kind of teach myself how to edit just by stopping the camera and then starting it again. You know, so I'd have to go, okay, I need a shot of my brother talking and he's going to say that line. And I, so I kind of taught myself editing that way. And so editing, I think, was the thing I was and still am most comfortable doing. And, and before I became a director, well, I didn't spend very long editing as an editor, like maybe a year. But that was really what I was doing. Like I, I was, that was the bit that I feel. And still now I feel like we go off and we'll shoot all this crazy stuff. And half the time, you know, maybe you go in with a plan, but often the plan changes. So a set it can be increasingly i'm um, getting used to it but at the beginning it was very very stressful mm -hmm. and you all you can see is all the shots you don't get and you're on set and the 
the actor's car gets stuck in traffic and you've got you know an hour to shoot a scene that you need six hours for and you've been planning for three years i would get really really stressed out internally i wouldn't i try not to communicate it yeah. but when we got to the edit suite it was like this is this is where i, I love it this is where i belong because you can now everything you know what you've done you've done the stressful bit now you can get to have some fun with the material mm-hmm. so i think it's probably still still the bit i'm most comfortable in but i think and now the shooting bit is where i have the most fun because you can now i'm a little bit more relaxed and i can let things go or i can just kind of go look for me, I've got the best job in the world, so just enjoy it. Don't feel so anguished about every every shot. Don't, don't kick yourself every time you have an idea just as you walk away from the set at the end of the day. It's like, it's fine. It's, you, you got Think about the 98% you got rather than 2% you didn't. Absolutely. That comes with experience, absolutely. Um, yeah, your experience, specifically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to be very old before you understand that. <laughs> no, I didn't mean it like that. I meant just like the <laughs> last minute ideas uh pressure we need to release something kind of yeah stress but yeah, yeah. But also you just kind of i think it's partly having great there's mostly having a great team around you you know you can reassure and and especially because the director you know, again seems kind of a bizarre thing to say but actually it's true that the director is the least experienced person on the set always because the camera person go finishes a job on the monday then they do another job on a Tuesday, then they work another film for three months and they're always working. But most mm-hmm. directors are not working that often, you know, unless you're in commercials or something like that. Most directors, film directors, is like you make maybe a film every two, three years. I mean, I've been lucky in that I've tended to just work nonstop, but most people, there's like big gaps between mm-hmm. one project and another. So actually you turn up and you're like, how do I do this again? And say you've got six weeks, seven weeks to shoot, you probably spend the, at least the first week trying to remember how to be a director. And that's all in the film. <laughs> that first week is all in the film. It's like, you can't just go, yeah. The first week, we're just warming up. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, you have to rely on the people around you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Love that. Um, the next one we have is uh, not so much a question. It's mostly, uh, it's a thank you more, uh, more than anything else. We had a fan from Instagram who, uh, her, I think her name is Nata. She wanted to just say uh, a personal huge thank you for supporting ukraine you know we know the music video made you made with pink floyd earlier uh this year and just the support for that and, and uh i know that you know the ukrainian fans and fans in europe who would really, really who really really appreciate the work that you do there and the support that you have given for that uh, as well so we definitely that's really sweet we wanted to send thank you Nata. as well no it's really very that's very kind of i think you know like like all of us we've talked about some of the stuff and some of the issues that the weirdos video raises. And I think similarly with Ukraine, I think it's, we all feel very helpless. And I think that's, you feel like if you can just do a small thing, then it's at least you don't feel quite as helpless. I think, yeah, it's horrendous what's happening in Ukraine and it doesn't seem like it's gonna have a, it's gonna it's gonna go on possibly for years. So I, yeah, it felt like Pink Floyd coming together to try and do something to raise awareness was amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The last question we have is, uh... What's the best part of still being best friends with your college friends? Well, I, it's, it's, it's crazy because I assumed, you know, when I went to UCL, that first, the first week, first two weeks that I got to know all these people, I assumed that's what everyone's lives were like at uni. Cause I, I kind of hated school and I felt like, I mean, talking a bit about being a weirdo or being a misfit, like I definitely felt like that. I had, it wasn't like I, you know, there were people, perfectly decent people around me, but it's like, I hadn't really found my tribe like i'd had i had one best friend and everyone else was kind of like i just know i just didn't it wasn't the environment that i particularly liked and then i got to uni i was like this is amazing this is what i always hoped life would be like and i met all these incredible people and there was everyone was so talented and particularly a lot of bands and a lot of musicians and i loved music like i grew up playing like classical music rather than um uh, than rock music but i was there's a little bit of your brain even though i i definitely don't have the gene to be in a in a band like i'm not I hate the limelight. I don't, I definitely, I'm, I'm on the right side of the camera, but I, there's a little bit, I think of all of us, like what would it be like to step out on the stage and what would it be like to be talented enough to be able to pick up a guitar and write music. And then I got to hang out with people who were doing that every day. So I was very lucky. I didn't, I didn't know at that stage they were going to be as successful as they were. You know, there were a few bands at school, sorry, uni who um, were all amazing. Like I, I could see any one of them, all of them taking over the world and i could also see another scenario where it just felt so far away that it was it's impossible so being friends now i think it, it kind of came about as as a result of coldplay coldplay like they're, they're well the fact that they became big so we would turn up at all these different gigs and we would support them initially when 
you know, it was just us. They always had a crowd because it was all their friends. And then even as they became bigger and became more successful, they would always get us along that, you know, Will or Chris or Phil or whoever would just ring us and say, oh, we're playing next week. Do you want to come? And even as they became massive, you know, I think I'm sure a lot of bands, once you become huge, you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a little bit embarrassed about, you know, the fact who I was when I was 18 or who I hung out with. But they were always the opposite and they were always very inclusive. So I think that's why we will stay friends. And yeah, it's, it's crazy. You know, it's really, it's crazy, but I, but I love it. It's very, I feel very, very privileged to, to, you know, still know them and just to have them as friends. That's amazing. Well, is it, go for it. I was going to just ask one last question. Like when you see them on stage at say like Wembley Stadium or something, are you able to, you know, and you're there as a, let's say a fan and not working. Are you really there? Are you looking at them thinking, oh, they're, they're my friends? Or are you just like, oh, the show is awesome. I'm going to jump around and bounce around to the music. Oh, it's a bit of both. Uh, yeah, both of them, because I'm still like, I'm, I'm still as big a fan as I was at the beginning, you know, and I, and it was me and, and a few friends at the, at the very, very beginning, literally just jumping around and screaming as if there were 50,000 people in the audience, except there were just three people in the audience. <laughs> and I remember when that clip that we talked about earlier about that four, the four years where Chris made this kind of, this amazing psychic prediction about where they the, how they were somehow going to take over the world in four years which came true he even got it down to like within one day or something two days um he yeah he had that kind of confidence but i remember that the night before was it yeah i think it was the night before or it was that day they had their they did the gig and the gig was supposed they were supposed to be on uh, just before this other band space and i think they were supposed to be on say they were supposed to be on at six or seven at this farming college, which is like, it's not the greatest gig of your lives. You know, Phil had managed to get it through his personal connections, but you know, it's not Wembley Stadium. And somehow the confidence that Chris, you know, when he, they came out on, on I think they got delayed and delayed and delayed. It was seven and they were going to be on eight. Then it was nine. They finally went on stage about 1230 at night, just before the curfew. And to one drunken farmer and me and our best friend, Chris Foof, who we were the two roadies, and just the two of us screaming, that was it. That was everyone else knew, and everyone else was just busy trying to snog someone or get drunk. And it was sort of the only and, and yet to then still make that prediction when that's just happened to you is is nuts. But anyway, that's that's how you become Coldplay, I guess. It's amazing. And um, you know, that's also how you become Mac White Cross when you are talented enough to know that, you know, these people can do something and I wanna film them and I wanna make sure that I get everything correct and send out their message to to the world. So you know, the role that you've played in this band's journey is also massive. So thank you again from us fans so much, Matt. Uh, both for everything you've done for the band, all your work that you've put in into your um, career, but also for coming and speaking to us today. We've taken up a lot of your time. You've answered a lot of questions, so we really really <laughs> appreciate it. It's right. total pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, it, we should do it again. But it was. It was really fun. And thank you to everyone who I can't see out there, but thanks for tuning in and for your great questions. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Ian, as always. And we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.